Good Mental Health, a podcast series that examines the tweets of Dr. Neil Marinello. He's a behavior expert with near six decades exploring the human condition, currently a life coach in Woodstock, Vermont. I'm joined by the good doctor for this series. We appreciate his insights here. Uh, a reminder, you can follow the doctor on Twitter at Coach Dr. Neil. Today's topic is pretty much an extension of our last two uh, podcast uh, topics. Uh, again, we're really talking here about how perception informs reality. Um, and this today's topic is, uh, is sort of an extension of last week's. Uh, if you remember last week, we said there's what's real, what's not real, and what we perceive to be real. And today's topic is reality exists, but meaning is interactive. Dr. Neil, why don't you uh, explain the uh, theory behind the tweet for us? Uh, well, when I first uh, heard this topic, uh, it struck me that uh, a couple of anecdotes uh, may help. Um, so let me uh, tell you a story or two. Uh, True stories. Uh, I was at a, uh, uh, my wife was in charge of the uh, 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 Norman Williams Public Library here in Woodstock. And uh, I was at the library gala uh, many, many years ago. Uh, and uh, the gala was the big money maker for uh, the library supported for it. And uh, uh, we were sitting there at a big dinner and there were other couples sitting at our table. And uh, one of the women uh, sitting next to me asked me uh, what I did. And I told her I was a shrink. And she immediately reacted uh, to say, oh, you know, uh, I had the most horrible experience with a shrink I've ever had. Uh, and I said, uh, well, tell me about it. And she said, well, uh, first off, uh, uh, I work here in Woodstock and I had to go all the way to Springfield. And uh, I immediately started getting a little question mark in my head because I was working in Springfield. And uh, she said it was many years ago and, uh, uh, and I only saw the guy once and it was a horrible experience. And, uh, and I began saying, I have a feeling that it was me. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, she was talking about maybe 20 years before and I'm sure I had gained a few pounds in the interim. Uh, and she obviously didn't recognize me and I clearly didn't recognize her. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, uh, 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 my lawyer recommended that I see this guy and I, uh, I went into his office and, uh, and he, uh, he put me through this horrible experience. He um, had me changing chairs and pretending to be my boyfriend and, and then pretending to be myself and I had to switch chairs. Uh, you may remember some of this uh, gestalt process that was developed by uh, Fritz Perls. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, what was the problem? She said, well, I, I kept having this series of boyfriends that were all alcoholics and they were all mistreating me. And, uh, uh, and uh, it was a terrible experience. And, and I was doing it for uh, must be an hour. I couldn't even go back to work for the next week. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, did you see him again? Uh, uh, knowing the answer. Uh, and she said, uh, no, of course not. I never wanted to see that guy again. And I said, well, uh, who's the guy that you're with? Oh, that's my husband. Uh, uh, we've been married long. Oh, about 15 years. I said, does he drink? She said, no. <laughs> it clearly worked. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I, I have to be careful about uh, uh, whether it's appropriate to demonize me or not in certain circumstances. Uh, the other thing that... Uh, uh, that occurred to me in regard to this topic, uh, reality exists and meaning is interactive, uh, is a story that uh, uh, somebody told me. And remember, I'm 77 years old. I've been around for quite a while here. And I'm virtually the only uh, uh, person with a doctorate degree in psychology who has operated within 20 miles of Woodstock for many years now. Uh, and uh, uh, this guy had seen me uh, in the uh, late 80s. And he came back to see me after many years. Uh, he had referred cases to me, but he saw me maybe half a dozen times and then didn't see me for, uh, for at least a quarter century and came back and saw me about another problem that he had. And he said, uh, Neil, you know, you told me a story that changed my life. And I said, oh, that's interesting. What was the story? 
And he proceeded to tell me a story that uh, I didn't recognize. And uh, uh, about halfway through the story, I realized what what the story was I had originally told him uh, because it was an actual experience I had had. Uh, and I realized that the story that he had changed and the ways in which he had changed the story had depended on the situations he found himself in. And so every time he found himself in a situation where he had to make a decision, he remembered the story and he changed the story a little bit. And uh, by the time he told it to me again, it was virtually unrecognizable. Uh, and I was trying to figure out, okay, so what did he actually get from his sessions with me? And I realized probably all he got was my intention. And my intention was to help him. And he would change the story in a way that would help him to make the right decision in each situation. Uh -huh. uh, again, the, the meaning that someone gives to their experience with me uh, is quite different in both of those situations. And it's absolutely far from what I perceive as the truth. Of course, there's also my perception, my memory of the story may be distorted also. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, the reality is that we would need a videotape of the sessions I had with those people, as we've talked about before, and we'd have to watch them a whole bunch of times. Right. And, uh, you know, what's uh, coming up for me again is uh, that this this nihilism, uh, if, if I can call it that, this tweet, um, is really sort of just another way of saying what we've been saying pretty much throughout the series is that, you know, there is a, a fundamental reality out there, even though each of us lives within our own reality, within that larger context of, hey, we're on a planet, it's the third planet from the sun, it has gravity, and, you know, these are realities, uh, if you will. But it's how we significate uh, everything uh, within our own reality and what it means for us. Um, and uh, I've been watching a lot of um, some content on the IDW, in Intellectual Dark Web. Um, and, uh, Brett and Heather, uh, Brett Weinstein and Heather Hine just uh, came out with this really great new book called um, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to uh, Navigating the 21st Century. Uh, and, it, and it's talking about how we as homo sapiens are being faced with this incredible amount of change. So much so that what our pathology is from um, a, a uh, anthropological uh, uh, mindset, uh, we're, we're sort of being overwhelmed because the amount of change is so much that we can't keep up with it which may be indicative of some of the psychoses that we see in our, so our society today. Um, and so that's why I think, you know, what we're talking about here is sort of even more important because it is about trying to develop this self-aware framework as to how to go out into that reality that is constantly in the midst of this change, um, and how do we make sense of it all? Yeah, yeah, there's no question, but that uh, uh, just in the last few years, there's been uh, this exponential uh, growth uh, in the flooding of information uh, to our minds. And everybody, as we've talked about before, has a different way of thinking and understanding how that way of thinking is affected by the data that we're exposed to. Uh, I mean, I, I remember uh, uh, my wife, who was the, uh, uh, the nurse at uh, Woodstock High School for uh, uh, about a quarter century, uh, uh, talking about uh, how uh, uh, with a particular student, the idea came up of uh, uh, communicating with her mother. Uh, and my wife suggested they do it by email. And the student looked at my wife and said, that's so 20th century. <laughs> Mind you, they don't know what a dial-up phone is or, you know. So it, uh, the exponential growth of, uh, of, uh, and, the, and the flooding of data uh, that's happening with the internet uh, results in people um, 
interpreting the data that they see in various ways and twisting it in ways which suit their own particular way of thinking. And if that way of thinking has been distorted by uh, uh, things that they were told as they were growing up, and we've talked about you know, how people get stuck at different ages and stages of life, uh, then uh, we run into the same problems that we've talked about before, the uh, 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 taking the ball, running the wrong way with it, and scoring a touchdown for the other team type of thinking, uh, which is happening all the time now. Uh, it's uh, happening, you, you can't watch uh, any uh, TV news show uh, without being exposed to unbelievable amounts of distortion uh, coming from the, uh, uh, the particular spin that uh, that comes from the way of thinking of the person who's telling the story. Uh, so uh, we are looking at uh, the fact that, uh, that the world is completely different and the ways in which people are thinking uh, is have not changed except by virtue of the way they interpret the data that's being presented to them. Uh, yeah. Reality exists. Meaning is interactive. That's the topic for our podcast uh, session here today with Dr. Neil Marinello, behavior expert. Near six decades exploring the human condition. Uh, he's tweeting on Twitter. You can follow the good doctor at Coach Dr. Neil. He's uh, currently working as a solutions-focused life coach in Woodstock, Vermont. More thoughts, Neil, on reality being real, re existing, but meaning is interactive. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm certainly reminded of people who might be in uh, institutions where um, they might have a compromised sense of reality uh, and might be under medication, that itself, which might cause its own reality. Uh, so, well, I've worked in, uh, in a lot of mental hospitals in various times, and uh, I think there are very few mental hospitals in the Boston area that I didn't work in when I was uh, uh, living in Cambridge. Uh, at the same time, um, it, it really does come down to uh, interactions in terms of person to person talking. And when someone, when I'm talking to someone, I am looking for understanding how they think. Uh, when I started off in this business, I was uh, uh, the lowest of the low, uh, a, uh, a psychiatric aide. Uh, and I've talked before about uh, the situations I had where I was asked to special, in quotes, meaning spend the entire uh, shift with one person. And you can't spend eight hours with one person without understanding some of how they think. And uh, uh, and without them understanding some of how I think. And so the interaction winds up determining what their perception of reality is. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, uh, specialing one woman who was uh, uh, diagnosed as manic and, uh, uh, and wound up getting shock treatments to treat her mania. And I had specialed her for quite a while. And uh, about 15 years later, uh, I was uh, checking into a hotel with my wife and uh, this woman walks up to me and says, are you Neil Marinello? And I said, yes. And she said, I thought I recognized your voice. I hadn't seen her or had any contact with her for over 15 years, uh, but something in the interaction that she and I had had, uh, had dropped a nickel. And the, the, uh, I remember talking to uh, the old, uh, the, the minister of my church, uh, he and I worked together for 15 years, and, uh, and I remember saying to him at one point, what's your, what's your theology? His name was Daniel Jantos, and, uh, and I said, you know, when you and I get together, which was, you know, once every couple of weeks, we just talk about uh, uh, the relationships in the church, and he said, well, I don't think that my theology goes much further than that. He said, I think my theology basically comes down to my relationships with people, uh, one, one or with the congregation. Uh, uh, so this particular topic uh, may be uh, a summary of all we've talked about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's sort of what I feel is, is you know, we'd sort of briefly chatted before we uh, started here today in that 
it brings up a theme that I feel is prevalent throughout your teachings, if I can call them that, and that is, again, it's how we significate it, which is our, in essence, our reaction to our surroundings. And so one of the things that I've been trying to practice uh, for you know a while now is how to be more stoic. And that is to not be swayed by my emotions. And, and that isn't to say that I'm trying to deny my emotions. Um, it, quite the contrary, it's actually trying to be separate enough to be able to recognize them from what they are in a way that it's not going to sway me to some sort of uh, reaction that in itself may cause another series of cascading events. Yeah, I think that there's something weird about me with regard to what you're talking about, because uh, uh, I get in touch with my emotions often after interacting with somebody. Mm. Uh, I spend a lot of time alone. I do a lot of meditating and I get a lot of what I call ahas, uh, which are awarenesses of what was actually going on in my interaction with so-and-so. Uh, I got a few of those uh, uh, thinking about our relationship. And uh, it really comes down to, uh, uh, to the fact that uh, when I'm talking to someone, uh, I feel like I'm channeling. I feel like uh, uh, what comes out of my mouth uh, doesn't really have much to do with what I'm feeling. And what I'm feeling, I get in touch with after the fact. And in trying to trace that, looking at my own pathology, at my own history, I realize that uh, it probably stems back to uh, when I was 15 years old uh, and taking a, a summer school course in American history. And uh, that course was being taught. Uh, now, remember, this is like 1960, 1959. Uh, that course was being taught by a woman who was a disciple of Joe McCarthy. Uh, very few people remember Joe McCarthy, but he was the guy who uh, created the uh, House on American Activities Committee uh, and uh, went after an awful lot of uh, uh, very famous uh, actors, actresses, and writers calling them communists. Uh, and she believed that he was uh, uh, a, uh, a hero, mm. a wonderful man. Uh, at the same time, I'm taking this course over the summer because I don't have room for uh, taking an American history course that I need. And virtually everybody else in the course was somebody who had flunked the course previously. Uh, so this woman is, is espousing uh, a philosophy uh, and a way of looking at the way the world is happening, uh, which I saw as quite distorted. I wound up uh, uh, getting into arguments with her in the class. There were about 30 people in the class, and I'm sure that they were being very entertained by the fact that this woman and I were crossing swords. Uh, at any rate, uh, in the middle of that class at one point, uh, I was taken out of the class, taken home, and told that my father had died. Okay. Uh, at which point, uh, I, uh, I think I went into some sort of shock. I know I wasn't aware of any feelings that I was having. Uh, I, I really didn't understand it. It probably took me, in some ways, it took me 10 years to figure out what the two immediate reactions were that I had, uh, uh, which were basically, uh, 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 first, you know, how dare he die on me? Mm -hmm. I was very inconsiderate of him. I needed him. Uh, the second was, if one of my parents had to die, I wish it had been my mother, uh, both of which were so unacceptable that I forgot about them for 10 years. Uh, at any rate, I, uh, I go back uh, uh, after you know, a few uh, uh, days uh, to my American history class with this teacher, and she says, uh, Neil, I really need to talk to you. And uh, I got together with her, and she said, I felt so terrible. We were arguing, and then you found out your father died, and I feel really guilty about that. And I'm looking at her like, where the hell do you come from? <laughs> what I've been through has nothing to do with that, had nothing to do with the fights we had. And yet, here she was, you know, a real human being, feeling horrible about the fact that she was getting into fights with me about something that had nothing to do with what had happened in my life. Again, the same issue. 
uh, reality exists. And what the reality was, was that I was knocked to the mat by my father's death. Uh, and, uh, but the interactive aspect of her relationship with me was completely changed from her point of view. It had virtually no effect on me. In fact, I think it may have been the start that, that particular experience may have been the start of my separating out my emotional reactions from reality, you know, so that I could then say, okay, well, what's really going on here? Try to do what you're talking about, be stoic, step back, see it, uh, uh, say whatever feels right at the time, and then check it out afterwards. Well, and, you know, on that point, you know, as you're talking, I mean, it, 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 it is bringing up just that for me in that one thing I've noticed about myself is that there will often be an initial reaction. And my nature is probably one that some might say is negative in that I will say no to a new idea or something. We'll just give that as an example. And then maybe two to three days later, after I've had a chance to ruminate on it or to explore it and to, again, be separate of the emotion, that decision may come around 180 degrees to be like, no, you're right. I, I agree. I see your position now and, and you're right. Um, so that's why, in a sense, I, I, if I can get there quicker, you know, that would always be the hope. Uh, yeah, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to process things because, again, we're talking about conscious, subconscious interaction. And the conscious mind very seldom uh, accepts the fact that the subconscious is 100% on its side. The conscious mind gives the orders. And often the order is, I don't want to think about that. Uh, and so the subconscious has to find some uh, uh, sneaky way. Uh, to get through to the conscious mind. It can't be direct. It has to be through a dream or through some sort of aha, or if you happen to spend a substantial amount of time alone, as I do, uh, you wind up uh, uh, getting these flashes of, oh, that's what, that's what, was, that's what, was, going, that's what was going on. I think that uh, uh, in, in, in my experience, the only real emotion that I am aware of uh, when I'm talking to someone uh, is uh, this kind of time to get into action emotion. It may, it's, it's some combination of uh, mad and scared, I think. Uh, there's definitely a glad involved. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of any sad, but uh, at any rate, there are times when I'm talking to someone when suddenly I'm energized. And uh, I'm opening my mouth and things are coming out. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to say until it's already come out. Mm. And afterwards, I look at it and I say, why did I say that? You know? mm. And usually my subconscious provides the answer. Mm. And then I figure out, is there a better way for me to say that? And uh, I'm getting better at it. Lately, there aren't that many better ways I think of. Yeah. Yeah. We're speaking with Dr. Neil Marinello on this podcast series, Good Mental Health. Our topic for today's session is reality exists, meaning is interactive. And Neil, why don't you wrap up and give us uh, final thoughts on this topic? Reality, I believe, is uh, uh, something that can only be approached through uh, uh, constant examining and re-examining the experiences that one has and examining it from every perspective. So uh, I feel like I can see reality when I can see myself as others see me, when mm -hmm. I can interpret what goes on in my interaction with someone as that person uh, that I was talking to was interpreting it. And it's, it takes quite a while to get to that point. But once you get there, I feel like, aha, uh, uh, now, I'm, I, I can understand the meaning of the reality of the interaction that I had with that person. Uh, that's why when I'm trying to understand uh, what your experience is, I'm asking you what the experience was of the person that you were talking to or that you were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And if you get inside that person's head, then you can see reality more clearly. Yeah, that's a tremendous uh, um, awareness to be able to get to that. And, and, you know, when I follow Eckhart Tolle, you know, he talks about 
if you're to kind of, you know, just silence yourself for a moment, and if you can feel your heartbeat and feel your breath, you are aware. And then you become aware of you being aware. But there's a third awareness that is aware of you being aware of you being aware. And that's sort of what I feel you're talking about here is, you know, to be able to disengage and yet connect with another viewpoint, which has to come from something else, right? I call it the subconscious, but and some people can call it the unconscious. Some people call it God. Some mm -hmm. people call it your soul. Uh, all I know is uh, uh, it's so complicated that, uh, that the only way to get at it is through a simple way of looking at things. So for example, uh, uh, in my reductionistic way, I define meditation as giving your conscious mind a stupid job to do. Uh, so if you have a, a mantra, uh, say the silly syllables over and over again. Uh, and when you realize you're not saying them, then you start saying them again. That's the stupid job for your conscious mind to do. Meantime, you're, so you're freeing up your subconscious to get those messages through uh, uh, in whatever way it can. And uh, uh, the meditation that I most commonly do is a form of biofeedback, which is just putting my fingertips together and being aware of my pulse. Mm. And I can feel my pulse. And uh, at the same time, uh, whenever I am not aware of my pulse, I'm not doing my job. So my conscious mind has to be aware of my pulse. Meantime, I might go when I'm doing that for minutes uh, uh, or even hours without knowing that I'm not focusing on my pulse. Mm. Because what's happening is there's a flow through taking place uh, between the subconscious and the conscious. And as long as the conscious trusts my subconscious, uh, I get whatever it is I get that helps people. Yeah, if I can, you know, offer just a similar thing, it's, um, you know, sometimes I might just find myself in front of the TV and I'll start zoning off um, mm -hmm. and almost entering sleep, if you mm -hmm. um, And I'm now to the point where it's like, I kind of enjoy it because my subconscious takes me on these really interesting adventures in those times mm -hmm. because I'm in a state of awareness um, much greater than if I were actually sleeping. Yes, yes. And in fact, uh, many people uh, overinterpret uh, things like uh, watching TV uh, or hypnosis or sleeping or whatever. Uh, basically, what's going on there is that uh, you know, if you're watching a TV show or reading a book or whatever, you're being led by somebody. Sure. And the person reading you is the, the writer of the book or the script writer or whatever. And uh, uh, if you're watching, there are some TV shows that I watch and I know uh, I always get in touch with the, where, where the scriptwriter's head is at, and and I know that uh, that there's a formula here. We're going to get a mystery. It's going to get solved in some way. The cops are going to do this yeah. at the same time. I like the characters, and I'm going along with that. Uh, but suddenly, I'll stop the TV, and I'll make and I'll come up with a tweet. And I didn't even have any idea that that was what was going on. But there's something that was going on in my watching that that, that triggered uh, a subconscious message. And now I've got the job of, of doing the, the haiku of the tweet, uh, uh, meaning that I have a certain number of characters in which I want to get my idea across. Uh, the, uh, the simple truth is that, uh, that uh, the reality of what's going on inside my head uh, is uh, a very real process. At the same time, there is a reality of what's going on outside my head, and there's the reality of the interaction between me and whatever's outside my head. Uh, and uh, uh, with the, the recent stuff where, uh, uh, where anytime you, uh, you buy something from Amazon, Google winds up figuring out what it is you like and don't like, uh, there are now as an interactive process between you and what's going on on TV. Mm. Wonderful. Oh, our uh, thanks to Dr. Neil Marinello here on our uh, 
podcast series, Good Mental Health, where our topic has been reality exists, meaning is interactive. And uh, we'll follow up that uh, topic next week with uh, the meaning anything has is what you give it. Really just a continuation, Neil, of what we've been talking here today. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and uh, you and I have both used the word significate many times. Uh, that's not a word. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm the one that made it up. Uh, <laughs> but I do know that uh, it's the only way I have of uh, uh, simplifying this process we're talking about. Well, we'll uh, learn more about that on our next series. Until then, I'm Matt Kelly. On behalf of The Good Doctor, we're both wishing you good mental health.